the underlying goal is to catalyze the emergence of beneficial general intelligence. And I mean, this just has a bunch of different aspects, making a decentralized AI platform that's owned by everyone and no one and can't be controlled by the power elite is one aspect. Yes. Making compassionate, loving robots that can be meditation assistants, you know, yes. elder care workers, teachers, and carry out other good works in the world. This, this is another piece of it. The use of our AI technology to try to cure aging and disease by analyzing genomic and medical data. It's a lot of different projects, but actually they're all connected together totally. in, in a common core. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are at the Transformative Technology Conference. It is fantastic here. There's so many diverse, brilliant minds. We are now sitting down with Dr. Ben Gertzel. Hello. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming on to the show. Really appreciate it. And Ben is known as one of the world's leading AI scientists, um, SingularityNet, uh, Hanson Robotics, Decentralized AI, Foundation now, Alliance. There's, um, you're working on so many other projects. Yeah. And, and he has four kids, which is nuts. Um, however he ends up doing this is crazy to me. I don't know yet, we'll have to figure it out. Um, before we get to all the epicness of the projects that you're working on, how did you become who you are? Where were you born? How'd you pick up your interests? Tell us about that. Well, I was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to American parents. My dad was there doing his sociology PhD work on Brazilian student politics. And uh, when I was pretty young, we moved back to the U.S., to Eugene, Eugene Oregon. So I, I sort of grew up among the crazy hippies of Eugene in the late 60s and, and, and early 70s, which probably, probably left a mark on me, right? My, my dad was a like Marxist sociologist at that point. My, my mom was very involved in you know, anti-war pro protest movement and then the women's rights movement, civil rights movement, all these things. So I sort of grew up in this social change type of ambiance. But my, my grandfather, my mother's father, was a physical chemist. So he taught me a lot about science and sort of sparked that interest mm -hmm. in me. His sister was a physicist also. And so, I, yeah, from an early age, I had an interest both in advanced science and in you know changing the world for the better and mm -hmm. i got interested in science fiction very young from watching the original star trek with my dad and that's where i first got the idea of ai there was a little robot in the original star trek which was like zooming through the through the galaxy and then you know kirk and spock had to deactivate it by presenting it with logical paradoxes and <laughs> I thought that made no sense. I was like three or four years old. I'm like, if this AI is so smart, like how can it be fooled by these childish paradoxes? But it, but it piqued my, my interest. I started reading science fiction. And sometime around 73 or so, I encountered a book by Gerald Feinberg, a physicist, called The Prometheus Project. And he said within a few decades, humanity is going to create superhuman AI, molecular nanotechnology, and human immortality. And then the choice will be whether we develop this, you know, purely for materialistic purposes or for spiritual advancement. And yes. I was maybe seven, eight years old, read this book in the <laughs> local library. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Why isn't anyone talking about this, right? Exactly. And so then I, you know, I became more interested in AI and psychology and Buddhism and time travel, mm -hmm. life extension biology, physics, all sorts of things. And... Eventually, in my late 20s, I, I got a math PhD. I graduated college when I was 18, mm. got a math PhD at 22. Wow. And shortly after that, started working on AI and quickly realized that, you know, it was a big job to build a general intelligence, but seemed like a feasible and possible thing to do. Yes. And started pushing on that, started trying to build AI systems with potential for general intelligence in the mid 90s. Had an AI startup in New York in the late 90s, which sort of rose and fell with the dot-com bubble. Was in DC 
doing AI consulting for companies and government agencies from, I guess, 2002 through 2011, and all the while sort of developing my ideas on how to build general intelligence further and further, as well as doing research in a whole, bu whole bunch of different areas that we probably won't talk about today, like life extension biology and the science of the paranormal and lots of weird stuff. And is that with OpenCog? OpenCog so has been a project since 2008. So there's been a series of AI systems I've worked on, yes, yes. which had sort of common principles, but each one advanced further and further. So between 97 and 2001, we had an AI system called WebMind. And then from 2000, in 2001, we started a company called Novamente, which is an AI consulting company. And we, we built a system called Novamente Cognition Engine. In 2008, we open sourced pieces of that to form OpenCog. So OpenCog formally started in 2008, but it was built on some software and ideas that have been developed a long time before that. So we, we've been trying to gradually work toward artificial general intelligence for, yeah. for quite some time. And then, of course, I moved to Hong Kong in 2011. And why did you make that move? I fell in love with a Chinese woman, basically. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's kind it. Of the crux of it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's the real crux of it. Yeah. But a lot of other things fell into place, also. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I got around. The reason I started going to Asia is in 2007. You know, my friend Curzio Vasapoyo drew me an economic chart proving to me that the U.S. was going to go bankrupt on September 25th, 2008 which was right around the time Lehman Brothers went broke, right? <laughs> so we sort of had the idea that there was going to be a financial crisis. So I started getting some contracts to do AI for companies in, in Japan. We're, we're talking to a Korean university. A friend of mine wow. had, a, had a you were working your anti-fragility in advance. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. I started looking at some Chinese <laughs> universities. Now, on this tour around China, two things happened. I met Ray Ting, who's now my wife, in Xiamen, China, where she was doing her PhD. And I met a guy named Gino Yu mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, and we, we applied for a research grant together and got a research grant at Hong Kong Poly U mm -hmm. for some open cog research aimed at video game characters and, and, and robots. So there's a woman, and then there's a research grant. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And on the <laughs> other hand, my, my kids who had, I'd, been, I'd been raising in Washington, D.C., yeah. were growing up and going away to college. So it was sort of a time when it was... Yes. It, was, it was convenient to make a move. And I was also getting a bit worn out on the U.S. military and intelligence industry, which, I mean, yeah. at that time was sort of the, the best and almost the only way to get paid as an independent AI researcher. And, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, having had work to do for Northrop Grumman, SAIC, and, and so forth, ultimately for government clients. Yeah. I mean, it paid my bills. It let me support an AI team in Brazil while doing some AGI R&D. But around that same time, you know, the AI ecosystem was developing further. It was becoming possible to make a living doing AI for things other than military and intelligence. And so I moved to Hong Kong. Which your parents would be like, yeah. <laughs> let's get away from it. Oh, no, I mean, you know, it was mostly good-hearted, well-meaning people in, in D.C. Yeah. that I worked with who really felt like they're protecting the world from bad things. And yes. they, and you know, they are protecting the world from a lot of bad yes. things. So there's an amazing number of nasty things that almost happen and, and are averted by, the, by intelligence agencies. Which so, is when people say, oh, the, yeah, military, yeah. the military budget's so, so big. And I'm like, but there's a lot of things that were safe well, here because of they do, There's a lot of things I didn't agree with there. Totally. But, there, but there's also a, lot of, a lot, also a lot of good that was done. And I mean, the world is a yeah. complicated place. Yeah. But on the whole, I'm happier now not, not working on that, right? Yeah. And yeah. so in Hong Kong, I did a bunch of things. I did a machine learning-based hedge fund. I did this research with uh, Gino, and then I had a good friend named David Hansen who was in Texas doing humanoid robotics. Mm -hmm. I introduced him to some people in Hong Kong who ultimately got him funding for his company. He moved to Hong Kong and brought oh. Hansen Robots to Hong Kong, yeah. which is a beautiful place to do robotics because across the border in Shenzhen, Shenzhen. You, you have the world's hotbed of, of consumer electronics manufacturing yeah. and hardware generally. Yes. So I became chief scientist of Hansen Robotics. Love it. And 
you know, at that time David was creating the original Sophia robot. He had a bunch of other cool robots. And give us a time that. stamp as his 20... Sophia was launched in 2015. 15. I think the original sculpture might have been 2014. Okay. Cool. At that time he had some other robots we were experimenting with first. Robot Einstein and Philip K. Yeah, Dick yeah, and yeah. Bina 48 and, yep. and so forth. Yep, yep. So then we decided it would be interesting to use the OpenCog engine as sort of a beefed up control system for the Hansen robots. Yeah. And that, we started working on that in 2014 and now like, as of the last month, we're starting to really use OpenCog within the Hansen robots in, in, in public appearances and so forth. So it was, a, it was a bit of a journey to get there just because we'd never used OpenCog for a real-time control thing before. We'd used it to analyze genetics data or to analyze stock market data for the stock market and we used it for you know, research and advanced machine reasoning. <laughs> Controlling the robots was the first time we'd used the OpenCog AI system to to control a real-time system, which required a lot of changes. And David and I had a lot of common interests, I mean, common interest in the benevolent singularity and Philip yes. K. Dick. We also had a common interest in making a robot mind cloud, like a mm -hmm. cloud, mm -hmm. a cloud-based framework for storing the knowledge of many, many different AIs and robots so yeah. they could all share information. Which became singularity. And yeah, yeah, and that, that grew into singularity. I mean, we could see that you know, Ethereum-based smart contracts and the blockchain and quantum computing yeah. should, all, should all feed into this. And then I met Simone Giacomelli, a young blockchain guru from, uh, from Italy, due to David Hansen basically introducing me to a friend of Simone's who then brought Simone to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And when Simone and I met, we immediately saw how to create the Singularity Net. Yeah. That was May 2017. Then. We raised some seed funding for that in July 2017 and then did a whole bunch of uh, publicity and software development and concept refinement, mm -hmm. did a token generation event, token sale in December 2017 and now basically that's been going full speed ahead. We're launching the beta of the Singularity Net, you know, blockchain based decentralized AI mind cloud project in February of next year and we're now we're doing a spin-off of Singularity Net called Singularity Studio, aimed at, aimed at basically building enterprise software applications for pharma, fintech, IoT, and so yeah, on, yeah. leveraging the Singularity Net platform. So Brilliant. this is now yeah. exploding in all different directions. And I mean, yes. the underlying goal is to catalyze the emergence of beneficial general intelligence. And yes. I mean, this just has a bunch of different aspects, making a decentralized AI platform that's owned by everyone and no one and can't be controlled by the power elite is one aspect. Yes. Making compassionate, loving robots that can be meditation assistants, you know, yes. elder care workers, teachers, and carry out other good works in the world. This, this is another piece of it. The use of our AI technology to try to cure aging and disease by analyzing genomic and medical data. That's another aspect of it. I mean, I started doing cloud-based machine learning for longevity genomics in 2002-3, before it was possible, before it was popular, rather. Yeah, yeah. And you know now we're progressing much further with that. So it's a lot of different projects, but actually they're all connected together totally. in, in a common core. Totally. OK, so I, I love it because this is what I care about so much and what a lot of people really care about in the field of being being really proper, adequate, loving, caring stewards for Earth. Um, so we have a general intelligence, a uh, benevolent one that nobody owns, but people are able to access and contribute to. And then we have a, um, a benevolent robotics, loving, caring robots that can help society move forward. And then also the um, just understanding all of this beautiful data within our bodies and then, and then increasing our, our um, our longevity being really staying healthy longer. Yep. Um, so, so these things are just, I love it, I love it. I'm so happy you're doing it. I can't believe you're able to balance all of this stuff. Um, so now let's, and also when you first started talking about you being a kid, I was, I was you know, no, no, I don't really know that many people when they're like, you know, when they're three and seven, when they're starting to really unpack these really, in, these really interesting, uh, I guess, 
ways of seeing the future that, that excite them at that young of an age. So I would also really like to see more young kids uh, have that sense of, of youthful inspiration that you had that catalyzed you to finish your PhD when you were 22 um, and start companies and, mm -hmm. and build the future. So, okay, let's, I guess let's start by asking you about the convergence of all of this is fascinating. It's multidisciplinary. A lot of people see it see it that way that it's so nuanced and intricate, multivariate. So, how do you figure out where these things overlap and how to how? Because you know you know way more about AI and machine learning than than of course me and even a lot of the people that even that are even in the field. How do you know where to allocate? resources for like how things overlap and so you don't have to build it twice. Well, I think I, I, I tend to have a fairly abstract point of view on things. I mean, my PhD was in math and I always tended to philosophy of mind and metaphysics and so forth. So I, I tend to look at the more abstract patterns binding everything together. And so from, from that point of view, these things that appear different are not that different. I mean, the AI system and then the economy in which Singularity Net acts and the human body, I mean, these are all complex self-organizing pattern systems. And if you look at things in this more abstract sort of pattern dynamics point of view, then the commonality is even more apparent than the, than the differences. And of course, computer science supports that. It can, it can be the same data structures and algorithms dealing, dealing with all these, all these things. I mean, of course, to do real things in the real world, there's endless amounts of nitty-gritty issues and compromises that need to be made. Because even though these systems are, in some sense, of common organizing principles and dynamics, I mean, if you're doing bioinformatics, you know, you need to hire people who know the nitty-gritty of molecular biology. If you're doing robotics, I mean, you need people who are good at connecting the anchor from the motor to the inside, inside of the robot's face. So there's the biggest sort of leap I made in my life probably was from being a theorist, trying to understand everything, to trying to build stuff and do stuff, which rapidly verged into leading teams building stuff and, and doing stuff. Because theory you can do as one guy just sitting there thinking and coming up with one idea right. after another. But at the level of complexity of modern technology, there's only so far one guy can go in programming a complex system or building a piece of hardware yeah. or analyzing a biology system. So, so that was entrepreneurship. That was a big yeah. leap from yeah. theory into yeah, entrepreneurship and sort of technology leadership. And that, yeah. that probably has not increased my overall happiness level, I would, I would say. So you want to, interesting, and but, but, tell us but about But it that. has been exciting, you know? I mean, yeah. And it's been you're very creating. interesting. You're, you're making real stuff. And of course, there's a level of understanding you only get by engaging in, in making real stuff that you'll just never get by, by sitting and theorizing. Theories, I mean, yeah. not, not to minimize the value of what you get by sitting and, and theorizing. Yeah. Like, I mean, I love, I love the philosophy of Kant and Nietzsche and all these guys who sat and thought and went down a certain intellectual rabbit hole as far as it can possibly go, right? <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. On the other hand, by engaging in groups of people and by engaging in the physical world with complex technologies, I mean, you certainly gain a different different sort of understanding of things. So it's, yeah. been, it's been super interesting. But I, I would say, I keep saying after another one or two more years of this, I'm going to take a step back and focus on theory, theory and pure again. research again. Yes. But it, it keeps not happening because there's more and more interesting. interesting and amazing stuff to build, right? Yes. Uh, it's cool how you go through a heavy theory, heavy entrepreneurship, back to heavy theory, looking to do heavy theory. I'm still yeah. doing both, still but doing I, I do yeah. like I do theory in odd moments here and there, and, yeah. and that is a limitation because sometimes you just need to spend like a few months, yes. like 15 hours a day, bearing yes. down on some on some conceptual thing, and yes, yes. 
I don't have time for that right now while running these different projects. But that's, I mean, I can't complain because these are all really, really amazing things. So, I mean, it, maybe within a couple of years, there's enough stable management in place for the various projects I'm doing that I can step back and spend like two thirds of my time on, on theory again or something. And the, the, one of the biggest keys f for you then is to find people that can do the work as well as you can or as close to as well. A as lot you of can. people who are much better than me at many Even aspects. Better. A lot of Even people. Better. I mean, there's, yeah. we have loads of amazing software engineers and, yes, and my programming skill has degenerated since I've been doing other things for so long. And of course, yeah. in, in biology, we have people who have just comprehensive knowledge of the human body at all different levels, whereas yeah. I know a decent amount of biology, but I'm not at that level. And of totally. course, David Hansen and his team not only have more technical knowledge of robotics, David has this amazing artistic flair for creating systems that can connect to people, right? And that's, that's yeah. been a really inter interesting thing. So I, I saw how some people were just connecting to the Sophia robot on an intuitive, almost animal level. And I mean, that's where I thought, well, let's try having her be a meditation guide or something, because yes. it seems like, can we leverage this spooky connection that some people feel to the robot yeah. to cut, grab people and then push them in the direction of positive growth and consciousness expansion, right? Yes. But I would never have thought of that if not for, you know, engaging with David Hansen and his technology, which is based on his background in, you know, film and arts and na narrative and a whole, whole different part of the universe than, than the things that I was used to. Now, how, how does, when you're talking about this abstract thinking that I, I love so much too, it's multidisciplinary, it's, 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 it's calculating a lot, it's, it's synthesizing, calculating, analyzing, synthesizing information. Uh, I, I love that style of, of thinking. Then to take that and then go and build something practical into the world that There's brings a lot value. Of, there are a lot of intervening steps, actually. So yeah. Tell us about the other That's interest. a challenge. Tell I mean, I think the, the approach we took with OpenCog was sort of like having a high-level theory of how a mind should work, to have human-like intelligence within restricted computational resources, and then sort of going bottom-up, saying, what could I build using available data structures and algorithms that would then satisfy the constraints of this high-level theory? So it wasn't so much that we started from the high-level theory and built down, which I tried but didn't get anywhere or didn't get far enough. Yeah. If you start with the high-level theory, then you try to design up, but you're constrained by matching with the high-level theory. So you're sort of going, in a way, bottom up and, and top down at, 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 time, at the same time. And, the meeting and, and I think in biology, it's, cool. in biology, it's sort of the same way. Like you, to combat aging, you need a systems understanding of aging. Yeah. And how things are going wrong in different parts of the body, different levels of the body, how the different systems are interacting. But then if you're designing a therapy, you're probably still poking like a small number of genes or molecules, but you want to poke that small number of genes or, or molecules in, in a way that fits in with the higher level understanding that you have. And if you don't do that, you're just going to make a localized remedy rather than, than, really, than really help. So for, for example, you can look in aging at like the extracellular matrix, the, the molecules in between the cells in, in, in the body and in between the organs. This gets stiffer as you get older and older. And from a systems view, you can see this is very important because this is, this is where signaling happens in different parts of the body. The contours of the extracellular matrix correlate with acupuncture pathways. So there's, there's a lot of systems understanding that tells you why the ECM is important. But then if you want to fix that, then what do you do? Well, okay, why does it get stiff? There's these cross-linked proteins. For example, there's glucosapine molecules. So we're working with Christian Schaffmeister at Temple University to design like a nanotechnology-based molecular scissors that have spiral ligamer molecules to cut the cross-linked glucosapine molecules, right? So there, there you're starting with Christian's nanotech technology and like what can you do with it, mm -hmm. which will be valuable in the context of this, this systems model of, of, of aging. So you, yeah. you got to start with the whole system and start with what your particular tools can do and find the middle ground where they, yeah. where they, where they meet, right? Yeah, that, 
that thought process is actually extremely important. A lot of people come in with a vision for how they want to change the world, and then I'm always like, amazing vision, like what are the short-term steps to get there? And then it's also important to see how does the vision meet the short-term steps yeah. um, in the middle. That's really cool, Ben, I like that a lot. Um, run, us, run us through right now, um, there seems to be a lot of artificial intelligence that is coming into the world, and how does one accumulate that into the general intelligence singularity net? And then how do, how do people access the, the general intelligence? How do they apply it to their practices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a complex story, un unsurprisingly. So, I mean, we can really look at what we're making as, a, I guess, a network of networks of networks in a, in, in, in a way. And of, but of course, human life is that, right? Like the brain is a network embedded in the larger network of the body, embedded in the larger network of society, embedded in the larger network of the ecosystem, <laughs> right? So AI has multiple levels like that also. So I have the OpenCog system, whose knowledge representation is a network, a weighted labeled hypergraph, and there's multiple AI algorithms acting on this common knowledge graph such as some neural nets for pattern recognition, a logic engine to deal with abstract knowledge and reasoning, evolutionary learning which evolves and creates new things, and these all act together on this common knowledge graph, which then has a goal system associated with it, and can try to choose actions that it thinks will help achieve its goals, given the current context, where the understanding of the context and the actions is given by all the knowledge in this graph, right? So that's OpenCog, which in itself is very complicated and we yeah. worked on it for a long time, in, and which I think is quite good at generalization and abstraction. We're still working on optimizing it, but I think the core is there. The Singularity Net is a platform in which multiple AIs, maybe based on quite different principles, can be networked together so they can all talk to each other, they can all communicate, share data with each other, outsource processing to each other. So. These AIs can provide services to outside users. They can be used in the back end of various software products and websites. But the AIs can also outsource services to each other in, in complex patterns. And so that's, that's another level of network, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you need some AIs in there that have a fundamental power of generalization and abstraction, like OpenCon mm -hmm. does. But this can then work together with simpler types of AI, and they can coordinate together into a network whose intelligence, in a way, is greater than the sum of the parts. I mean, so you can look at that sort of like how, you know, different organs in the body are networked together, mm -hmm. and, in, and they each have their own intelligence, but the whole obviously has more co coordinated behavior than the sum of the parts. Like then, different cities on the yeah, economical grid. as well. Yeah. Then we're also working on something called the DIA, the Decentralized AI Alliance, mm -hmm. and that's an alliance of different decentralized AI projects. So SingularityNet is ours, which networks together OpenCog with a bunch of other AIs, but then there are other projects like Ocean Protocol, which is a blockchain-based decentralized data network. There's mm -hmm. Shivam, which is a decentralized network for genomics-based mm -hmm. AI. There's Deep Brain Chain, which uses blockchain for fast training of deep neural networks across many machines. So we want to network together these different decentralized AI networks into a sort of network of networks. So that's why we have a network of networks of, of networks and all these levels, it's, it's complicated, but that's what we see in nature. Yeah, and I, yes. and I think, I think yeah. in different ways, that's what we see on the internet already. So I think yes. that's the right way to think about it. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't need core generalization and abstract reasoning algorithms in there. Mm -hmm. It's just that these and in some ways, you could say these are the crux of it for AGI, but all the other parts are important too. I mean, just as in your cortex, mm -hmm. there's certain microcircuits that are really good at abstract learning and reasoning. Mm -hmm. But if you just put these microcircuits in a, in a vat, yeah. they're just going to abstractly reason about their own abstract reasoning in, in sort of vacuous loops, right? Mm -hmm. It's by putting them in the network of the brain, which is the network of the body, of the society, of the ecosystem, that you're getting, you're really giving these abstract learning circuits, the ability to, to prove their worth. Yes, yes. Okay, I liked how you were describing it. It finally started coming together more, more for me, and I, and, I, and I like that, and hopefully for, for others as well. Okay, now 
is when you, when you feed a um, when you're feeding open cog, which has the ability to abstractly reason, when you're feeding it an, uh, an, a to-do of some sort, uh, how does it parse that and make sense of what it needs to do within its, within its framework to bring about the result? Well, open cog can ingest a lot of different types of knowledge. So, I mean... There's a language parser where it parses out English language now in, into nodes and links that try to represent the semantics of that English language. It doesn't always work, but sometimes, yes. sometimes it does. And you can also take computer programs, like little Lisp programs or something, and import those, and, and, and then they turn into nodes and links in its, in it, in its knowledge base. We also have like specialized data importers for types of bi biology knowledge, for example, or accounting knowledge and so forth. And, and these, d in the, when you import the data, it, it, it goes into the whole and it's organized into bu bu buckets, nodes, areas. Not and buckets, it's organized into nodes and links, nodes which all, all connect to each other. So not, never the buckets. No, it's yeah. not partitioned. Exactly, it's not but partitioned. But then there's okay. the reasoning engine looks at the nodes and links that came from data, including vision and hearing, as well as databases and language, and the reasoning engine takes those nodes and links that came from the outside world and builds new nodes and links. Okay, and that's how. Okay, and then and that's how you add to it. Yeah, when, yeah. And then, and then. Because I mean, what reasoning does is takes empirical knowledge and then generates new knowledge based on the empirical knowledge. And then, and then, what when you're when you're pro, when you're adding the knowledge and then you're trying to get what the an, an answer of sorts mm -hmm. from that. How does one? How does it compute? There is a tool called the pattern matcher in OpenCog. Okay. So if you want to find a collection of nodes and links matching a certain pattern, you submit a query and it searches the whole knowledge base to find things matching that pattern. And then there's the logical backward chainer, which if you give a pattern, it tries to find things that approximately or probabilistically match that pattern. And so if you're asking a question, some way or another that question is turned into a crisp or probabilistic pattern matching query that goes against that, that whole knowledge base. Got it. Okay. And then now... Oh, I'm yeah, we're getting pretty deep in the weeds here. Th right? Those... Yeah, but that, that's really important. Adding the knowledge, making the query, uh, and then getting some sort of results. And, and this is what I want to do a little bit is the roots, is the deep roots. And then also then I see the open cog with the singularity net able to work with the different AIs that are being Yeah, programmed. so I mean, if someone makes a great AI for, say, recognizing patterns in, in, in videos, mm -hmm. or, or say, for importing data from uh, accounting spreadsheets or something, you want an easy way for that to feed knowledge into an abstraction engine like, like OpenCog, right? Yes. And so Singularity, and it makes an easy way for different AIs written by all sorts of different people to connect together. And I mean, if someone else makes a different reasoning engine with different strengths and weaknesses relative to OpenCog, that can be there in the Singularity net also. Then some application can consult two different reasoning engines and decide which answer it likes better. Or one of the reasoning engines, if it gets stuck halfway through doing reasoning, you could ask a question of a different reasoning engine that could help it get unstuck, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of potential to having different AIs able to compete with and consult each other within a common network. Interesting. Compete and consult with each other in the AI networks. Interesting. And then the, and then the decentralized AI alliance gets in there as well. So this is n more new. This is your newest. That, that, that's, that, that's, that's new, yeah. We announced that a few months ago, but we're still forming it. I mean, the idea there, so there's a bunch of projects that are using blockchain-related technologies to make decentralized AI networks that are owned by, by the participants and democratically controlled, and they have different focuses. So, I mean, SingularityNet is a pretty generic framework for interconnecting AI. Is now mm -hmm. Deep Brain Chain, for example, is a decentralized network that is really fast at training deep neural nets. And Shivam is a, is a decentralized AI network that specifically gathers genomic data from people, stores it securely, and then does some analytics on the genomics data, right? So we don't need to replicate everything they're doing. 
we just let an agent, a node in the singularity network, talk directly to, to a node in the Shivam network mm -hmm. or deep brain chain. So if a singularity net node needs some neural net strain really fast, it may outsource that to deep brain chain. Cool. If, if a singularity cool. net node is analyzing genomics data and wants more genomics data, it might ask the Shivam blockchain, hey, do you have any data fitting these criteria that I could use? And then the AGI token, which is within the singularity net ecosystem, can be automatically converted on the back end into a Shivam token to, to pay for that. Cool. And then, of course, if you have reputation and rating, like if, if one guy has written a bunch of great AI in singularity net, and he has like a 4.5 star rating, then if he starts to do something in Shivam, he should get a high rating by propagation from yes. singularity net. Yes. So you, you can have both sharing of data, sharing of currency, and sharing of reputation and ratings among different decentralized blockchain-based AI-related networks. And I think this is how you can build an alternate AI ecosystem that can really take on the, the tech giants. Whoa, that last part, yeah. But there's a lot to be done, right? Yeah. And it's, it's not just building the tech, it's coordinating a lot of, a lot of people with different philosophies and incentives also. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. I, I, I love, the, so the, when a query is sent in, you're not even then limited to what OpenCog and Celerity well, that's have. Right. That, then you can access... Access a whole bunch of other networks. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, that's how AI brilliant. should be, That's right? how AI should shouldn't be, It shouldn't be siloed off. It yeah. should be open networks connecting to other open networks and learning and growing from each other. Won't the Googles and Apples and Amazons of the world, Facebooks, won't they die if they if they silo themselves and centralize themselves? It remains to be seen. I mean, I, I think it's not important to me that they die, but I think they won't be the dominant factor. I mean, IBM didn't die when mainframes became less important. There's still business niches for them. They sell a lot of mainframes to banks. They do services for big companies, but they're not dominant not anymore. Dominant. Wang Computer died, though. So, yeah. I mean, I don't say that Google, Microsoft, and Facebook will die. What I, what I say is they will not own the majority of, of AI anymore. That's and you know what niches yeah. are best for them to occupy? They will. That, 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 that really remains to be seen, right? Yeah. Interesting. So then the giants could turn into niches because there was... The giants could also turn into companies selling AI services on decentralized networks, right? I mean, there, there's, there's, a yeah. lot, there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, as Microsoft is morphing into a cloud company, right? So I mean, a company that's sufficiently agile, the brand name persists, but they can completely adapt. Microsoft is offering Linux on Azure all over the place now. Instead of instead of Windows, so I mean, the, we're not opposed to any particular companies. It's more the centralized modality of, of organization that, we, yeah. that we're trying to we're trying to get rid of. And yes. I mean, what history suggests is some of the leading companies will find a way to adapt to a new mode of organization of exactly. the industry, yeah. and some won't find a way to adapt, and they'll and they'll disappear. I mean. Yeah. I have my guesses as to which ones will adapt and which ones won't. But may, that's, we, that's, may we have your guesses? That's, no, <laughs> but, that, but, that, but, that, but, that, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, the time, time will tell, Time right? will tell, yeah. Wow. I, I would say there's a lot of people in leadership positions with, in Google who understand the singularity and advanced technology pretty well. They have a fairly strong ability to adapt, and not every big tech company shows that same ability to adapt. But then the evolution of business is, is incredibly unpredictable, right? Like, no one predicted IBM would be a services company, but yet they, man they managed to pivot, right? So it, it's quite hard to tell who will pivot to embrace the decentralized era. Like, I mean, you can see that in publishing industry also, right? Like mm -hmm. some publishing companies are going to are going to flourish and and some will some will some will disappear. Mm -hmm. uh. N now, w how do we put our eggs in your basket? Because y y we are we're relying on your ethical and moral 
standards with the general intelligence that you're building. As with anyone who would be building one, we would be relying on. Yeah. Yeah. You're relying on the community, not just me personally, exactly. right? Yeah. I mean, if in the unlikely event, like I were invaded by a Martian mind virus and went batshit crazy and became malevolent, I mean, there's a load of other contributors to, the, yeah. to these to projects. That, so yeah. it's about seeding a, a community mm -hmm. of people who are are thinking in somewhat of a, of, of a shared way and aiming to develop things in, in, in a benevolent manner. And what are the guiding principles of your community that make it ethically and morally just grounded and that we can trust that? Sex, drugs, and rock and Sex, roll. Sex, drugs, yeah. and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah no, I, 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 besides those, though, <laughs> nice. but besides that, yeah. I, 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 I think... Uh, I mean, at an abstract level, the ethical principles I've, I've written about are basically joy, growth, choice, and, and continuity. Mm. And I, I think all, all, all of these have, have an important value in a practical context. I mean, we're, we're trying to promote happiness and, and doing good, and, and we try to have a work environment and a community that, 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 that's fun to be in. I mean, we're trying to grow and expand rapidly and create new patterns, create new things, new, new technologies, new, 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 way, new ways of, of being. Choice means, you know, we want everyone to have agency. And yeah. that, that, that's an important part of the whole decentralized ethos. There shouldn't yeah. be a few elites control everything. And yes, yes. continuity means you want to respect the patterns of history as well as creating new patterns. And the, this includes like persisting human beings into the, into the future instead of replacing them with super AIs. It also includes being respectful of you know, historical cultures that exist now and, and, and certain people are, 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 very, are very tied into. And yeah. of course, values like these are very nebulously defined though and sort of interpreting what they mean is part of what, what a community does. And then, uh Approaching the end here, what can we see come from uh, the Hanson Robotics ecosystem? It's look. It's looking like we you're ta we're talking about assisted meditation. We're gonna. So the first yeah. thing is right now there's just a handful of human scale Hanson robots, but we're working with a factory in Shenzhen to scale up manufacture. Mm -hmm. So w w we we should have. Uh, within the next few years, a massive number of robots coming in, out of the factory. And I mean, these will be purchased by customers for a variety of different purposes, but the applications I'm most interested in are those that are you know, explicitly promoting wellness, health, and, and growth among, among people. So, I mean, meditation assistant is I interesting. Feel like, I feel like I didn't give your last uh, your four points enough love yeah, 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 a yeah. moment ago. I just want to give That's them... That's all right. We've got to go soon. I, I, I want to give them love, edu though, because Education is interesting. Thank and you for composing those <laughs> and for having that as, as, as an ethical and moral standard for, for, for building the community. Sure. So I just, wanted to, I just wanted to say that. We're also looking at making a, like a fully automated hospital room where you have sort of a Sophia-type robot to provide emotional support and conversation Hear, hear the patient's stories, tell them stories, answer their questions. Then, you, I mean, you have other robots to do physical things, like help someone, someone in, in and out of bed or change the bedpan or whatever. Then you have medical instruments in the room, and all of these are integrated into a singularity net powered control system mm -hmm. for the hospital room. So and that, what, what's, the, what's the practical one that maybe the uh, c consumer can purchase to, to Well, I, th I think that for the human scale robots, they're not going to be that cheap initially. Mm -hmm. So probably the initial application of the human scale robots will be sold to stores, hospitals, companies, and, and so forth. It's going to be a few more years after that before the price comes down enough. But then, then when the price is low enough, I mean, you'll have home service robots everywhere, just like in the, in, in the Jetsons, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. but much cuter than Rosie the robot. <laughs> so, so we're talking maybe like ten thousand dollar up cost to, for now to companies and or even more. Um, right? I don't want to set the price point because it's still to it's, it's still, still to be early. determined. It'll be yeah. it'll be leased each year, actually, Pro probably. Interesting. Probably, 
I mean, I can't say for sure, sure because yeah. that's Hanson Robotics business decision, exactly. but I can, yeah. I can see a future for, for a leasing model because everything's constantly being upgraded and improved. Yeah, and the other nice thing is that um, the, the, well, the, well, being able to up, upgrade and, um, and, and improve it, uh, the software can be done remotely, but then you do have to ship in the hard for hardware upgrades and whatnot. Yeah, so, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Hardware, hardware is a pain, but it's, it's uh, <laughs> very useful to have. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, and then um, I'm glad that we got to as much as, as, much as we did. I want to, um, <clears throat> are you, are, what, what are your thoughts about the multiverse? What are your thoughts about, about that? It's there. Yeah. 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 Tell, tell what do you want to know that? about it? I mean, just, just it's a big place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So time happens all at once. From some perspectives, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Ravelli's relational interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that mm -hmm. you don't want to talk about a phenomenon in isolation. You talk about a phenomenon in the context of a specific observer. Okay. So an observer, comma, yeah. observed pairs. So I mean, from our point of view, situated as humans, time is flowing in, in, in a certain direction, direction right? Sure, sure. From a different point of view, which is a more abstract view of a different sort of mind than we are, mm -hmm. then time happens all, all at once, once. And not only that, sure. there's not just one time axis. There's a lot of different, a lot of different yeah. time axes, which are sort of floating out there in the space of patterns, right? I yeah. mean, my, my general philosophy view of this is there's a much wider universe than, yeah. than this one. I've used the word Yuri cosm to refer to that, like wider cosmos, right? So yeah. if there's a wider cosmos, our physical universe is viewed as like one conglomeration of patterns in that wider cosmos. And if you want to look at you know, weird, poorly understood phenomena like reincarnation or seances, mm -hmm. those suggest that each of our individual minds has some sort of existence outside this physical world in some wider cosmos. Let's, let's lead you to that quick. Do you think that the consciousness is localized in the central nervous system or that there is a soul? Or what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, the word soul is very overloaded or with, spiritual, with religious. Spirit yeah, I mean, yeah. we don't have a good vocabulary for these things. But, but no, I, I think consciousness is imminent in everything in the physical universe and also goes beyond this physical universe mm. and that the individual consciousness associated with each of us can ex exist at times and places where our physical body is not there. Interesting. Which suggests a model in which, you know, our physical like universe is embedded in some, some larger sort. space and then maybe the mind patterns characterizing an individual also have an existence that isn't respected to this 4D space-time continuum. Yeah. So that, and I've, writ, I've written a bunch about this. If someone Googles the coinage Yuri Cosm, E-U-R-Y Cosm, which I made up, it <laughs> only exists in my writings on these crazy, crazy topics. So, yeah. I mean, this is the sort of stuff I would love to be thinking about all day. It's on theory side yeah, of things. And, and, how, and how to experimentally poke, poke at it. Poke at it, right? yeah. Because I think you could experimentally poke at it totally. by by poking at paranormal phenomena, maybe in animals or something, right? So yeah. there's a lot of interesting research directions here. And I sort of yes. look at this sort of thing is almost where AI was when I was a little kid. Yeah. Where it's like just getting, yeah, that's, it's that's just getting hard. started. There's limited amount of understanding. Yeah. No one gives a crap, right? So now, now, I mean, I sort of feel impelled to make AGI really happen. Yes. On the other hand, the part of my mind is bored with the AGI because I didn't think I know how to do it. And I'm attracted to think about these other things that are like things. wide open and <laughs> I don't, I barely know where open. to begin, which is yeah. how AI felt when I started with it, right? Yeah, yeah. it's so wide open I and mean, it's so fascinating. It's, 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 it's gonna unlock so much more beauty and potential. It's so yeah. cool. Well, an interesting question is if you have a superhuman AI, will it figure out how to unlock all these spooky parts of the universe that we I barely understand right now, and I would I would imagine so. So yeah, I love it. Well, with the with the general intelligence that that you're building, it'll have a lot to to play One with. One would hope so. So anyway, we we've reached the wider multi 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 multiversal trans cosmos. So so that that 
That that may in, may indicate the conversation has and ex one, expanded to its one, end. One yeah. one time and, yeah. and to collapse it down. Yeah. What about the formation of the mind of a child that is born into the world? Yeah. Do you have a protocol? We do a pretty good job. We have an adequate amount of you know water and electricity and food and these basic necessities, but. The, the education of the mind at a young age to yeah. have some basics that that you know the, the, to expose the children to that you think would be really helpful moving forward. Well, I mean, I've raised three kids. I'm in the middle of the fourth one, but I, I don't know that I'm that system, systematic about it. I I generally speak to my kids as if they were adults and just explain the world to them in a simple but reasonable way, and I. I tried to teach them all a lot of math, science, literature, arts, history, and so forth. And yeah. one of them, my oldest son, became a mathematician and AI researcher. The others didn't like math so much, but they, they each learned a lot and went, went in their own, own direction. I mean, my, my second son is a Sufi mystic and an amazing uh, classical pianist. So they, yeah. I mean, my, 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 my daughter did a degree in, in environmental science and is is helping with the education in Ethiopia now. So yeah, I mean, I, th I think kids intrinsically are curious and open-minded. So if you, I mean, if you let them explore different things and exactly. and expose them to a lot of different information, they're they're mostly going to going to grow in a, in a beneficial way. But th this is like standard progressive education doctrine. Though yeah. I would say. I'm working with UNESCO and with Bethlehem Desi, who's in our mm -hmm. Ethiopia office, mm -hmm. on defining an advanced technology-based curriculum, which we want to roll out in schools around the world, K through 12. So wow. I, I help define the I help define sort of the, the high level of the curriculum, and then folks at UNESCO are working on the details, and we're going to be testing that in schools in three or four countries over the next couple of years. But this is it's more yeah. about like let's get some cool technologies and let's put them in the hands of kids yeah. just in a way where they can explore and yes. experiment with them. But let's also get school systems in various nations to embrace this so that by doing this, kids aren't doing something off to the side that doesn't help them pass the university entrance exam, but that what they learn through this experimentation with you know, AI, robotics, biotech or something ties in with, with how they're assessed to let them, let them move forward through the country's education system. Yeah. So I'm... It gives yeah. them that experiential edge. Yeah, so abstract thinking. The, cha the challenge is we sort of know, we know how to do that. And I homeschooled all my kids for various parts of their, parts of their childhood. And I was also co-founded a charter school in New Jersey. So, I mean, I see like progressive education methodologies are not that mysterious now. And working tech into them in creative ways is not that mysterious. The biggest challenge is structural and institutional, wherein, like, if when, when one laptop per child went into Ethiopia, where we have a big office, so I spent a lot of time there, I mean, their laptops were perceived by the teachers there as a pain in the ass because kids just were playing with these cool educational games and, you know, making simulations, composing music. But that was distracting attention from passing the exam that would get them into university, mm -hmm. which is quite challenging in Ethiopia. Yes, yes. So what you need is to make the system embrace progressive education, yeah. which is actually harder than, harder yeah. than defining how the progressive education should work. Because they're given the tool, they're able to pursue what they love, but then the system's requirements are you must fit into these boxes. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And there, like, not a, not a high percentage can go to college. So I mean, if you fail that university entrance exam, it's bad. It's not like the U.S. where everyone can go to university. So, yeah. And China is the same way. Like the university entrance exam is a huge deal. Really so deal, you yeah. need, if that exam is the focus, then there's a limited amount of creativity that parents right. are going to let their kids pursue. That's right. right. Yeah. So this, un unfortunately, so like reforming the world's AI tech ecosystem, I sort of see how to do like from the side, but I just build this decentralized network, you know, outsource services to businesses from this network and let the whole thing spread. Mm -hmm. on, on the other hand, reforming the world's education system, I don't see a way to do other than like work with governments to, yeah. to reform what 
how they do assessment, assessment and, 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 and evaluation because yeah. I mean otherwise you could provide all the cool like downloadable curriculum you want but if it's not what kids are forced to do when sitting in school eight hours a day yeah. then, then it's going to have a, a real but limited impact. Right? By putting the assessments and examinations on the children we're automatically <laughs> siloing time from them yeah, to yeah, those right. areas which then takes away from the other creative endeavors that they might be more yeah. passionate about. So UNESCO is interesting in that they're embracing both advanced tech and progressive education. So I'm trying to, I'm working with them to to work with with ministries yeah. of education in different in different countries. Yeah. Then what are you not doing? <laughs> <laughs> Sleeping. Sleeping, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's what you're not doing. Yeah. You are an amazing human being. This has been such a pleasure to talk and unpack this, even in its first preliminary stages. Um, whatever we can do to help with our network of, in, of, of, of builders, we'll do, as well as uh, hopefully when you're back in the Bay, we can do a uh, live event together promoting um, DAI and, uh, and even more that you're sure. up to. So yeah, we can do that with Lisa. We love Lisa as well. Um, so thank you again so much for coming all right, to the yeah, show. Thanks, is, thanks, thanks for all the good questions. Such a pleasure. Yeah, there's, right. there's too many questions to ask. Yeah, man. He's yeah. so awesome. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Give us a comment below with your thoughts about what we talked about. It's so much to unpack. Uh, also, join the Telegram. Join the public Telegram. Join us there. And also, go build the future. Go build your destiny into the world. Go manifest that. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Much love. We'll see you soon. Peace.